working with other authors can be an amazing experience. It can be an awful experience. How has working with other authors worked out for you? Uh, ooh, this is a question I kind of hate. But I'll answer it. It doesn't. We don't do it. Um, Jim Bain had a, he, he, a sort of a battle drill that he used for new authors. And I'm still pretty new, by the way. And that was to link new author up with old author, write books together. This is not my dog. All right? It's my daughter's dog. My dog's a real dog. Um, write stories together and build market for new author. He does that typically. Uh, he thought about pairing me up with David Drake, and then I, I understand these were Jim's words. Now, nah, Crapman and Drake, if you squeeze the books, it'd, they'd drip blood. That'd be a little too much. Um, Weber's a much more reasonable character than I am. Uh, that wouldn't have worked. Um, Eric Flint and I are, uh, we're pretty good friends, but we're politically so far apart. That wouldn't have worked. So he linked up John Ringo and I to do books together. John wrote a pretty good outline for a series we were going to do together. We signed the contract, et cetera, et cetera. And in the first year, I managed to write four, about 14,000 words, every one of which I hated. So uh, John and I were talking, uh, you can't do this, can you? No. <laughs> well, what do you want to do? I don't know. How about some puzzling books? Yeah, I can do that. Another puzzling book. Where do you want to do it? Mm, how about Panama? I know Panama pretty well. Served there for four and a half years. It is not my dog. It's my daughter's dog. Get out of here. Get. <laughs> Wouldn't be so bad, except he thinks he's a real dog. Um, anyway, um, so that became Yellow Eyes. So Ringo, at, when we're at cons together, you know, goes out of his way to say he didn't have anything to do with it. That's with Watch or Yellow Eyes. That's not really true. Um, he did write some of it, uh, and he did do an edit job, and, and they are set in his universe. That's why we can get, we can with a straight face put both names on it. Uh, John didn't want both names on them. He wanted John Ringo Presents Tom Cratman or Tom Cratman and John Ringo's Universe or something else, but Jim Bain was the boss, and Jim Bain said John Ringo Tom Cratman, so that's what happened. Um, so I can't say I've successfully collaborated with anybody. I've written stories in someone else's universe. Um, A number of writers have credited Jim Bain with saving military science fiction or keeping it alive. How do you see your works as fitting in that or benefiting from those efforts by Jim Bain? Well. In a real and legally binding sense, um, I don't write science fiction. I write military and political commentary with a pattern of science fiction laid over it. Um, I don't think that makes me unique, by the way. I think a lot of people write military and political commentary with a pattern of science fiction laid over it. Uh, David Drake says something about it, Jim Bain single-handedly saving science fiction by dragging it back into the gutter from which it belonged, uh, fr from uh, to the gutter uh, in which it belonged. Of course, he, he's, being, uh, he's being a little facetious there. Yeah, Jim Bain did probably save military science fiction um, from being anti-military science fiction, which I think was just about all that was being published Post Starship Troopers. I, I can't think of any pro military science fiction that was um, published for quite a period of time, 10 years or so, anyway. When you had, you had Joe Haldeman's The Forever War, well, that's not mili that, that's military science fiction, but it's clearly anti military science fiction. Um, not without some, some justification. I mean, uh, Haldeman was in Vietnam. We kind of screwed up the war, and it wasn't just the politicians who screwed it up, the Army did too. Uh, in any case, yes, there's a, a pretty good argument could be made that Jim Bain saved both science fiction and military science fiction from becoming uh, excessively literary to becoming entertaining and still educational, and saved it from the left. 
With all the technological changes that are coming about in communications, blogging, new media, uh, cell phones, other technologies, how do you see that as affecting military operations, uh, much less the future of military science fiction? I'm going to take the first part. Um, I said to my son-in-law shortly before he went in the Army um, that I would not want to be a company commander now, in a way, because every time I took the troops to the field, I would have to strip search them to take away their cell phones. It, I, I don't know if you, if you read the story. Recently, there was a guy whose cell phone self-dialed home in the middle of a firefight. And I'm picturing his poor parents, because the last thing here is, look out, look out, it's an RPG, and then the sound cuts out. They got to be thinking, oh, little Johnny is dead, <laughs> you know. Um, interesting question to which I, I don't have an answer. Will the presentation of, this, this is somewhat related, because really you're talking about telecommunications generally. Uh, will the presentation of war as it's happening undermine um, the conduct of war, or will people simply get used to it and a little more callous? I'm inclined to think that if they're allowed to, people will just get used to it, and it won't really cause any harm. Uh, I mean, there was no great outpour what the first time, or, you know, great, no great outcry the first time we showed um, bodies floating in the surf in newsreels during World War II. I mean, they'd held off, show no bodies, show no bodies, show no bodies. Well, they finally showed bodies, and people were okay. You know. Now, uh, that 45 or so percent of the country that's anywhere from moderately to hard left, they're not going, you know, I mean, they're, I don't think it's possible to sell them on the war if you show them nothing but Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm in a military setting. It's it just, you know, not going to make any difference to them. The people who are basically you know, more traditionalist, more nationalist, more patriotic, and yes, they are more patriotic, if any of you were listening, um, are going to say, well, that's the price, you know? And that, I suppose the key is that relatively few thousand people in the country who actually, in, in an unpredictable state, usually Ohio or Florida, um, decides elections. They may become a little more callous, too. Um, as for mill blogging, it's done good work getting the word out, um, I think, but it's not going to convince too many people who aren't convinced already. I mean, the, the country's pretty split, pretty polarized, and, and damn near evenly. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be sweating the election of uh, B. Hussein Obama, potentially in November. Um, But if half the country can carry the rest of the country forward, and if no blogging helps them to do that, you know, all to the good. What do you think about some of the efforts, even from within the military, to restrict or kill off mill blogging? Uh, well, well, there's obviously justifiable limits. Um, punching in operational plans, codes, radio frequencies or if we're using frequency hoppers the sequence of frequency hopping you know anything you would normally think of as secret has no business being in there backing off from that a little bit though questions like state of morale um of course if morale is good much better than the mainstream media is reporting it's really good to get out that morale is good what if it's not you know it, it, you can't say in it's not a principled position to say that we will only put out good morale. Uh, we will only put out good stories. Um, the, the good stories lose their impact, especially once it's known that that's all that you're putting out. Um, I'm inclined to think that short of operational information, um, they ought to have a fairly free hand. And yes, if they report that morale sucks in a given unit, Maybe it's time to change commanders. You know, maybe maybe that's just uh, an indicator that uh, to take a closer look at why. Um, let me interject a little philosophy here. It took me a while to figure this out. I, I commanded three companies in the army. Um, 
I once heard a general say that an infantry company commander was the last absolute monarch in the world. It's bullshit. Um, a military organization is a democracy. It doesn't have any votes, um, but it's still a democracy. It's, it's a, a little bitty civilization or society run by popular governments. The company commander is as much a rabble rouser and demagogue as he is a commander. Yes, there are places. He, he, he has power. He, ha he has influence, too which is often more important than power. Nonetheless, he can't simply ride roughshod um, over, call it, popular opinion. Uh, that led into your question, but ask the question again. What do you think of efforts to try to kill mill blogging? Mil -blogging. Ah, okay. Um, Yeah, so, okay, as I was saying, it is worthwhile. Information is to the good. Um, everybody in the, in the military is tactically minded. Everybody knows how to hide things. Um, everybody knows how to put on a show. Uh, and it's very, very difficult to tell what's from the outside what's going on in a given unit. I treat mill blogging for the most part as, I think of it as a kind of an IG. Uh, that can stick its nose into everywhere and uh, and delve a bit into the truth or at least give you hints on where to look for the truth. And overall, pro therefore, probably a good thing, even if it may have occasional bad aspects. You know, um, occasional bad aspects. Scott Thomas Beauchamp. Let's take an example. Scott P Thomas Beauchamp did damage to the war effort and to the army for, oh, I guess about 48 hours. And then the truth came out. Think about it. He damaged the New Republic, which is often an enemy publication, right? He undermined, uh, it's like that fake ranger who didn't get through basic. You know, he undermined the credibility of the left by illustrating the credulousness of the, of the left. Um, Overall, although I'm sure he didn't intend to, Scott Thomas Bochamp probably did us a favor, you know? And that's as bad as it gets. You know, somebody puts out a bullshit story, which is, how long did it take? 72 hours, maybe 48 hours? Not long, anyway. Uh, in, in fact, I think it might have been less than 48 hours before the first faint whiff of dog shit reached someone's nose. Um... Any real harm? No. <laughs> None whatsoever. Any real good? Yes. Some real good. If that's as bad as it gets, you know, give him pre pretty free reign. Um, because most people are not out to undermine the war effort or try to make a name for themselves by undermining the war effort. How vile can I be? If it gets too vile, Uncle Jimbo will get it. Okay. Or to get that extra special blowjob from his wife who happens to be on the staff of the New Republic. Um, overall, let him run, as long as it hasn't got anything that's operationally sensitive in it. That would be my guidance.